reminded me of something that we often come up in our work in Merizad about Baba's desire for harmony among those who work with him and for him. And Merwan's are always saying, you know, why do you all fight amongst yourself? Just think, Baba wanted us to be harmonious. It's very difficult to be harmonious, you know, but it's something that we have to do. And in fact, Baba had sent out a circular to the workers in Andhra who were having a lot of grief and aggravation amongst themselves. And one of the things that he said in that circular really hit home for me. And he said, don't think you're obliging me by doing my work. You know, Baba said that very clearly. He said, don't think you're obliging me by doing my work. I'm more than capable of doing my own work. I am allowing you to do my work. And in that, you are eternally obliged to me. So just because Baba's given us a chance to work in Merazad or work in Merabad, and uh, we are doing that, that's no reason to feel, oh, I'm so wonderful. No, it's not. <laughs> the moment you start feeling I'm so wonderful, you get worked harder and harder. So don't even go there. <laughs> this morning is actually a question and answer session. You know, I thought I was going to have a rest from thinking about what I have to say for myself. So please, can you start with your questions and answers? And then if, if, if need be, I'll fill in at the end. Yes, please. You mean I'm not spiritual enough? Of course I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Baba did say that he will forgive us everything, but he will not forgive us hypocrisy. So for me to come here and pretend to be um, pious and wonderful and holy would be so futile because he didn't make me like that. You know. Thank you. Thank you. I love the way I am too. <laughs> yes. Does anybody else have questions? You know, there's going to be a very long. F <laughs> if I yes. I think the, the themes in Sayyidina Baba are constant companions. Yeah. What has been your experiences of yours or others of, so that we can take that home and make him our companion? Well, I, you know, I live with Merwan and I look after him as much as he allows me to. And uh, you can't help but make Baba your constant companion in Merwan's company, because that's what his whole life is about. His whole life is about constant remembrance of Baba. Uh, as he says, self-effacement rather than self-aggrandizement is what we have to aim for. We have to aim to efface ourselves so that everything we do is Baba and not us. And that's one of the things that I had um, asked Baba at the beginning of this weekend was, you speak through me. You know, do not make this about Mera Arjani, make it about Mer Baba. But I don't think it was quite as much about Mer Baba as I would have wanted or he would have wanted. But he makes everything happen the way he wants it to. So that's another thing that you have to remember is when you make him your constant companion, you surrender to the results. Baba says, do your best and then leave the rest to me. Don't get obsessed with results. Just allow things to unfold the way they do. And that's a lesson that I have had to learn, learn uh, living in Merasad because, you know, you think you're doing one thing and it suddenly turns out you're doing something completely different and you don't even know what you were supposed to be doing in the first place. And it can get very stressful if you are not resigned to his wish and will. Like Merwan said, take it as his prasad. Whatever is given to you to do, do it as his prasad. Don't say no. You know, don't ask for the prasad, but if it's given to you, don't say no. Um, I don't ask for any prasad as far as work is concerned. I say, give me whatever you want. I'll do it as best I can. But there are a lot of people who, and this is something that I have actually been thinking of, because as the people who live in, in Merabad and Merasad get older and older, we are going to need new volunteers to come and work for Baba, because there's no way that the current crop of volunteers is going to last much longer in terms of being able to do the work. They are, I'm Baba willing, they will live a lot longer than, you know, I hope for them to live as long as Baba wants them to. But 
they're getting older and they can't do all the work. But all the years they've been there, they have defined themselves by the work they do. So it's becoming very hard for them to let go and let other young people come and do the work. And so young people who come don't get enough work to do. They are micromanaged, so to speak. You know, the older ones tell them exactly what to do and how to do it, and they're constantly looking over their shoulders. And I think it might be lovely to have a program where young people can come, not forever, because today who can commit to forever when you're 25, 26? But if you have three months or six months, people should be encouraged to come and offer their gifts. Like we currently have a project that I'm very involved in and interested in and will start as soon as I go back, which is getting all the trust land records onto a computer uh, database so that it's all there and we can update it as required. And we, need, we will need young people to come and do the scanning and you know making up the online folders and everything. Excuse me. That was a very nice breakfast, but it does repeat on me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a good, good group of young boys and girls from Hyderabad who want to come. And they will come, but they can only come on weekends. And what the trust has done is they said, if you can get yourselves here and back to your places of residence, we will provide accommodation and food maybe in Hostel D or if they came in the summer and uh, in the Savages Kitchen. Now that's a good start, but there is a lot of young people who cannot even do that. And maybe in the future, Baba willing, I was talking to Merwan about this, there will be a char charitable trust that funds young people to come for three months or six months, you know, maybe five or six young people a year. Because we are going to need these people. We are going to need them to be there, learn the work, the way these people were taught, you know, they were taught to do the work in a certain fashion. But our first step, of course, is to convince the people that these volunteers are required. And, you know, with the best will in the world, you cannot continue doing everything yourself all the time. And that is a lesson we have to learn in making him our constant companion, is that the reason we are there is not because we are in charge of the water situation in Mehrabad or charge of the electrical situation. We are there because of Meher Baba. And if tomorrow he took the work away from you, if tomorrow he said, leave and go, you leave and go. It's what uh, I was told by Mehrwan when I first came to Mehrazad. He said, don't get attached to being here. If tomorrow you are told there's no place for you here, leave, you should be prepared to leave. And I am. You know, I lived outside, of, I mean, I lived out of a suitcase for years. It was very strange. You know, when I was young, I had this mental definition of success. And I thought, well, I will be successful when I have two houses and a fire engine red Mercedes convertible <laughs> jumped out. <It's> black. <laughs> Yours is black. I wanted a fire engine red one. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, no, no, thank you. But what happened was, of course, you know, as I grew older, this was in, when I was 16 or something. So as I grew older, I realized I don't like driving. I find it the most tedious thing in the world. Oh, perfect. So I cut off the convertible. I didn't want a car because if I didn't enjoy driving, what was I going to do with the car? So that went. And I did have, I had actually, I had more than two. I had the house in Merabad. I had one in England. And then I had... At the time, I had two flats in Pune, remember Vijaya? And I had another one in Mumbai, which was my grandfather's flat. But where does Baba put me at that time? He puts me in Merizad in Manu's room. So Manu was sleeping in one bed, I was sleeping in the other. Our servant Kesar, who by that time was going quite senile, she would sleep under my bed. And during the night, she would violently kick my bed when she had nightmares. And I had, all I had was a little shelf on a cupboard to put my clothes. No room. So he gave me what I wanted, you know, I had all those places to live, but I couldn't live in them. So you have to be really, really careful when you ask Baba for something to be very specific. You say, yes, I want two residences and I'd like to live in them, please, you know. <laughs> yes, it's like Dolly came to England one year for my son's graduation and it was winter time, so she said to me, she said, my, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see some snow? And I said, of course, it's time, you know, we might see a little sprinkle here and there. So she looks at Baba's picture and she says, oh, Baba, please give me some snow. <laughs> Nothing happened throughout her visit. There was no snow 
three days before she was due to fly out 10 inches in one night with a forecast for 10 inches the next day. And the roads were completely closed. The trains were barely moving. And she said to me, she said, my God, look at all this. Will I catch my flight home? I said, you should have thought about that when you asked him. <laughs> you, sh you should have said, Baba, one or two inches, not, not a whole lot, you know. <laughs> We barely managed to get her to the airport and then I got stuck in the train on the way back. And the day after she left, everything thawed. So two days after she was gone, there was no snow anywhere. You couldn't see it. I, I, I wrote and told her, I said, you are such an idiot. You should have just said <laughs> two inches, Baba, not, not more than that. My sister, she came for my son's graduation to England and that's that she came in November which was you know pretty close to when you have snowfall beginning but you don't have so much snow at that point in time however she she wanted to see some snow and so she asked she, she very casually turned to Baba's picture and said Baba wouldn't it be wonderful if I could see some snow she didn't specify how much snow she wanted to see she had to do that that's the same as me saying I'd like two homes you know you can have two homes you can have four homes but you won't live in any of them you will be in Merizad living in a little corner with Kesar cooking, uh, kicking my bed every night, poor thing. You know, she was very fortunate. Kesar was our family servant from many, many years back. And she, um, she came, wandered into Bindra house one day and she stayed. And she, she was married, she came from a good home. She was married and her husband adored her. But she didn't want to be married. She didn't like the physical side of marriage. You know, she always felt apart from such things and when she came here she when she came to Bindra house she was really looked like a beggar but she stayed and Baba said keep her keep her she was the one who ate up all my sweets you know <laughs> yeah she's the one but she was she had a kleptomaniac tendency like um, Korshid would say she's a little bit of a klepto <laughs> <laughs> And she used to eat my medicines up when I was a baby and I had stomach problems. And Baba once caught, caught her and Papa brought her to Baba and said, Papa, uh, she, Baba, you know, the child is sick and she's eating up all the child's medicines. I don't know why she did that. So Baba said, get a cake of soap. And he, he made her eat the soap. He said, eat that soap. And she ate it, she, she, whatever Baba did. She was devoted to Baba. She, in fact, when Baba was in seclusion, he, she was the only one allowed to take his milk and things to him at a certain time. So she was very beloved to Baba. But she was the one who moved to Merazad and who slept under my bed and kicked it. Kesar, Kesar, K-E-S-A-R. And you know, she was so sweet and loving and she looked after Gaimai, she looked after Manu. And the only thing she would do is, as she got towards the end, the moment Amartiti was done, she would say, when is Amartiti now? You said, there's a whole year to go, Kesar, you know, be patient. Uh, but she always, that was her thing at the end, that stuck in her head, Amartiti, every year. Yes? Mm -hmm. That Baba is specifically instructed that you can't kiss her. Me. Oh. For, yeah. So you could, because he's my child, I want to keep him, keep her for my home, myself, so you're not, and she was letting us know how, how agonizing it was. Yes, yes. Yeah. She, she said, my mom says that she used to just hold me against her and smell me because she couldn't actually kiss me. And she still doesn't. She still doesn't. But she had that order. Some, some people in the family had that order. Gai Mama could. Manu never did because uh, she, was, she was also given that order. Yeah, some people in the family were given that order. That they shouldn't kiss me. As a child. Not even mother. Mother still doesn't. She gives me hugs and everything, but she still doesn't kiss me. Because of Baba's order. 
you know, because also she couldn't punish us. So she used to lock me in the toilet when I was being naughty. She'd lock me in the toilet and she would put my sister on top of the cupboard. We had a cupboard, Godrej cupboard in our house. So she'd just pick her up physically and put her on top of the cupboard. And I tell you, to this day, I am scared of close places and my sister is scared of heights. And I always tell her, you scarred us mentally for life by doing that to us. Would have been better if Baba had allowed them to give us a quick smack now and again instead of don't punish her. But one of the things that sort of, you know, if you're never punished for doing anything, you'd, you'd never need to tell a lie because why would you lie? You know, if they're not going to punish you, what's the point of lying? So, What? You might become like a compulsive liar. It could happen. It could happen. Yeah, no, but I think also children, if they from the beginning that you know they know that they're not going to be punished, they don't learn to lie compulsively. They're more likely to tell you the truth. You know, we used to make up stories, but they were not lies, they were stories. And if somebody said, is that a story? You'd say, yes, yes, of course it is, you know. <laughs> yes. No, he said, only about me. He didn't say it about my sister, but it would have been dis difficult for my parents to punish her, but not me. Especially if I was the one doing all the mischief in the first place. You know, what would be the point of punishing the younger one just because she followed with the older one? You have, to, you have to punish both or none. Mm -hmm. So she, she didn't get punished either. So Baba said, he said, if you hurt her, you hurt me. Very simple. You know. So <laughs> that's why he didn't want me punished. It was enough suffer universal suffering on his shoulders without adding to it. In fact, Heather Nadal used to always say she was spoiled rotten from the beginning and the rot started with Meher Baba. But I don't think I'm spoiled. I don't think I'm spoiled at all. Otherwise, I would be such a brat, and I am not a brat. <laughs> no, it's true. I'm not a brat. <laughs> Questions? She wants to know about meditation. About meditation? Meditation? Um, how do you meditate? I mean, what is meditation? Um, it's like Tukaram said yesterday, uh, if you take his name while you work and do your day-to-day -day duties, you're meditating. And, you know, there is so many different types of meditation. There is a meditation of work. Work is a meditation. People who are musicians or artists, their work is a definite meditation because when you're singing or when you're painting, you are meditating and the source of your inspiration being Meher Baba, then you are meditating on him. And uh, I always feel that gifted people, their work is so bringing them so close to the creator that they can't help but be meditating on him when they work. You know, people who, like you who write poetry, when you're writing poetry, it's coming from Baba, it's not coming from you. So. So, but uh, now you need to translate it for her. No, no, not even in Merabad. You know, anybody's free to go into the Samadhi between 8.30 and 
8.30 in the morning to 6.30 in the evening and sit in there and meditate. In fact, I went in there and sat for 45 minutes trying to get a spiritual experience, which never happened. But uh, that, that is between you and Baba. You know, if you feel like meditating in the Samadhi, of course you can. If you feel that that's what you want to do, sit in there and take Baba's name and focus on him. But for most of us who live there and work there, we have to do this any spare time we've got between our work. Or like Merwan says, try and do it all the time, even when you're doing your work so that you're constantly meditating on Baba. And if you, if you lapse, if you stop remembering his name, then ask Baba for help because he has assured us, he has completely assured us, he has completely assured us that if you ask me for help in remembering my name constantly, then I cannot refuse. Now, there's the difference. It's not that I will not refuse. He said, I cannot refuse. So if you call him and say, Baba, I need your help in remembering you constantly, he has to help you. There is no way out for him. You know, he has no options. That's when you cut off all his options. Yes, yes. Well, he gui guided me towards being a psychologist as opposed to being a medical doctor because I was too lazy to be one. Fact. But when I became a psychologist, it was as if that was what I was supposed to do. I mean, I love people. People are my passion. I love all kinds of people. You know, I like looking at them, listening to them, talking to them. And it just seemed the right thing to do, to, to study psychology. But in my work, whenever I start talking to a client and I was saying this to was it Roy in uh, Marymount the other day who was the psychologist Ron Ron yes he was there we were just talking about our work and I said to him I said do you find that if you start off a session saying to Baba Baba you know this person has come to me for help I'm not capable of giving the help but you guide them through me my session goes just as it should. And he said, exactly. He says, it's so nice to talk to a fellow therapist who's also a Baba lover because that's what I do. And when I do that, then I, you know, I know that whatever comes out will be beneficial to the client because he's the one who's doing the work, not, not me. And that, that's how I find I work best. I just work best if, of course, our, my training and my knowledge and everything that I've gained through all the years of doing this helps a great deal. But which part of your training is beneficial to this particular person in front of you that only he can pick and choose and he can bring the exact thing forward that that person needs at that point in time? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I rarely get any sleep. I probably sleep like three or four hours uh, a week. I'm feeling good. Yeah. <laughs> the energy is so high that I, uh, you know, sometimes like three or four days, I sleep seven or eight hours. In three or four days, yeah. That's how yeah. I understand all the time. Exactly. So through my work, I'm connected with them. Yeah. So it's just the, all, all the, you know, dots. Yes, there, right? yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the fencing at Merizad. You know, we had this big um, altercation with the Pimpelgaon villagers, and we had a. They they are demanded a road, and we had to give them the road. Of course, because they had, we had to give them the road. We got them to sign a paper saying we would fence all our properties without any let or hindrance from the Gram Panchayat and the villagers. And now the road, uh, the road is up, 
and hardly anybody uses it. We, we're the only ones who actually walk our dogs and Merwan likes to walk there. And you know, it's become a boon for Merizad that there is this road. But also we've, we've been doing the fencing and in the beginning we had a lot of obstruction from the farmers who had had unlimited access to our lands and they were grazing their cattle there and using it as a public toilet. You know, they, they would not crap on their fields, they would come on our land and crap there. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It, you walk up the hill early in the morning, you're taking your morning walk up to Seclusion Hill, and what do you see? You see all these bare backsides on the hillside below, and you're thinking, Why are you here? Go on to your own farm. Why what do you want to sit here? So now we have fenced it all off, and we are going to put in trees, but we still have a few very contentious bits where the farmer is really obstructing the work. And uh, those, those two will, once we get all the legal surveying and everything done and our, our case is watertight, they won't be able to say no and we will go ahead and fence. But we are nearly 85% done. There's only very little left. And soon, yeah, the fencing, the fencing. And this year we are going to plant the trees. The first, I think 1,500 or 1,800 trees will go in. Yes, the saplings, not trees, saplings will go in. And Baba willing, if there's a good rainfall and they hold, then we will have a lot of greenery around Merazad. All of that barrenness. How many acres is there? I'm not sure, about 300 or so. Yeah. There's quite a lot of land. You know, we have, we have a buffer zone around the core property. Unlike what happened in Merabad, where there is a lot of building even on Baba's hillside. You know, there's these, they're not even Baba lovers, but some, some politician or businessman has bought a huge plot and built, is building this really great big house which will be on the hill itself, the back of the hill. Now had we had the foresight to buy that land and keep it protected, then Merabad would have been protected as well. But what's happening now, especially along the Kedgaon Road, is you're getting all these huge housing developments which is really going to take away from the serenity of the place. I, I've heard that there is a a man who says he is Baba's chargeman from Jabalpur, he's bought a plot and he's putting up a so-called dharamshala, which is going to have free accommodation and free meals, but of course he's going to be preaching there as well. Yes. And there's nothing you can do to stop him. You cannot stop him because he's a private individual who's bought a plot of land legally and clearly, and he owns the title to it, so, you know. But it worked. No, but what happened was they were encouraging Baba lovers to buy the land around Merabad and everything so that what they hoped was ultimately that land would be gifted to the trust and preserved. But what has happened is the land prices have gone so high, people have made small plots from those lands and sold them, which they're perfectly entitled to do because they bought it fair and square. It's in their name, so they can do that. And so say where to somebody bought a whole acre of land and even if in those times the trustees thought okay he's bought an acre of land he'll build one small house and then the rest of it will be open ground around the uh, samadhi area that's not happened that person has sold it and maybe 10 people have bought a tenth of an acre and are building bungalows over there so it's causing a lot of strain on the utilities as well the water is not there electricity is totally temperamental you get electricity for a few hours and then you don't get it for eight hours at a time most days. So it's not easy having a home in India, especially if you're a part-time homeowner. Uh, yeah, you know, we are not even part-time homeowners. My father stays there and he says to me, he says, it's such a headache. What with the property taxes, what with having enough people to look after the place. And as time goes on, servants will get more and more difficult to obtain. So people will have to do more and more of their own work. I think I'm going to set up a commune in that big house, you know. People who want to come and volunteer can volunteer. <laughs> it is, yes. You know, it'll be used. David, yes.
Yes. One was killed, one was killed. For some reason, they were let out on bail. And during the time that one of them, uh, they were let out on bail, they apparently offended again. They went and tried to rob somebody else's house and they were arrested, but that one of them was killed. One of, and one is still in custody. And there was a, a, a case, I know because um, Heather had to appear in court and it was very stressful for her to go and appear in court. So I, I think that's still ongoing. I'm, I'm not sure what happened with that one. Yeah. What's happened with Heather? She's a trustee. She, you know, she of course, yes. She, she's on holiday in Australia at the moment, but she'll come back. No, she feels fine, but because of her injury, she cannot do too, too much mental work for too long a period of time. She just has to take regular breaks. So. Well, there will never be like a conclusion to that story unless and until what actually happened is brought to light. And that can only happen if one of the family, Eriko's family, asks for an investigation to be reopened. Because I have a very dear friend who is a very um, senior police officer in Mumbai. In fact, he's the commissioner of anti-terrorism uh, police in Mumbai, uh, Maharashtra. And he said to me, he said, I would, he was a dear friend of Eriko's and Eriko and he were great pals and he loved Eriko. And he said, I would do anything, but I need somebody from the family to ask me to reopen the case. I can't just off my own bat go and reopen the case. And do you have any speculation about whether Heather doesn't want to do it at all. I think she, you know, she's so tired with everything she's gone through and with losing Eriko um, that she doesn't really want to go into that at all. And I think that's right because why should she unnecessarily focus on something that cannot be changed? Eriko is gone to Baba, you know, there's nothing we can do to change that. And if it's going to cause her so much distress to reopen the whole thing and go through all of that, then why would she do it? She needs to focus all her energy on being a trustee and doing what she can for the trust. Um, you know, there, there were all kinds of wild rumors circulating. And in fact, I was accused of starting most of them. But I wasn't even there. But. Uh, it would be very good. It would be good to have closure. But I don't think that's going to happen unless one of the family comes and says, please, could we have, could we at least have the file for the investigation? You know, I don't know whether the police are allowed to give that out or not, but that would take legal work and that would take people investigating it. But again, it, it's, it's the family's decision ultimately whether or not they want that to happen. That's what I heard very clearly. He was a long time resident in Merabad, you know. He was very precious to all of us because he was there to support whoever needed supporting. Um, if you ever went to Amartiti in the early years, he was the one who was always in charge of the toilet cleaning. You know, and he cleaned the toilets himself. He was true to Baba's practice that you know, if, if you can ask somebody else to do the work, you should be able to do it yourself first. So he would clean the toilets at Amartiti and uh, supervise the people who were doing it as well. And he's helped endless Baba lovers, you know, whether it's financially with advice, with uh, help in doing, getting some work done. So, that's right, for many, many years he was a night watchman by the Samadhi. And uh, he was a mathematical genius as well, you know. Yeah. That's right, yes, a lot of people remember that. Yes, he was a gorgeous guy. He was like a big teddy bear with a lot of brains. And a lot of heart. Yeah. were arrested in Suta, which maybe some of you know, 16 miles from Amunagar on the Suta Road. Um, and they, uh, that's where Baba and everybody stopped for the first night of the new life. And there's a government rest house that you can go there. And I thought that was a wonderful significance to make sense of this. So the other <laughs> thing, is, isn't that correct? And um, the other thing that helped ease my heart 
I know, yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And, That's true. If Baba did that to him, showed him what was coming yeah. before it happened. He, he experienced, he experienced it. Baba. Yeah. Yes. And filled him up. Filled him completely. Yeah. So. Mahu. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So my question is, um, uh, I'm having this conversation with a good Baba friend, and uh, so I, I want to see your view on this from Baba's perspective. Baba said, obedience is greater than love. Mm -hmm. The perfect match. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I'm not big on worship myself. I can only speak for myself. You know, I, I love saying Baba's prayers, but that's the extent of my worship. I find it very difficult to sit for hours and take his name. Uh, I can take it while I'm working, but you ask me to sit down and take his name, absolutely. There's a sister over there who cannot do it either. Yeah. I find that difficult. I take his name in my day-to-day -day life, but I cannot sit down and do it with focus for any amount of time, really. Um, selfless service, not possible. You know, I just don't do selfless service because I can't. Uh, everything I do because I am not realized is going to have some element of self. So anybody who says I'm doing selfless service, excuse me, load of bollocks. You know, it's, it's not selfless. Uh, I think what we need to recognize when we do selfless or when we do service is we are doing it because it makes us happy. So we should be grateful to the people we are doing the service to because they are making us happy by allowing us to serve them. You know, um, there was a very sweet beggar who sat in Koregaon Park when I lived there. Uh, he was really sweet. He had the most gorgeous smile. And we actually, every time I saw him, I would give him 10 rupees. And he, I used to say thank you to him because he made me so happy. We used to sit and, well, stand, I would stand, he would sit. And we would talk about his family and my son and everything. And we, you know, we developed quite a bond. And by allowing me to give him that 10 rupees, I got so much joy out of it. Yeah. Yes, so for me, that is, that's not service, that's just a pleasure. So everything we do, it's, it's because we get something out of it. Yes. So where is the service in that? The only person who does selfless service, as far as I'm concerned, is Mayor Baba. And that's because he cannot help it. He's in everyone. And He's outside of everyone, so everything he does, he does selflessly. Yes? So would you say that in our efforts to be of service, yeah. we're always gaining something? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Yes. And that's what Erich also said. If you take his name and remember him constantly, then everything that you do is actually the, the, the sanskars that would attach to you go straight to Baba and you don't get affected by that. But what you actually have from your past incarnations, your sanskaric burden, that becomes lessened because 
you are expending the sanskars while you go about your day-to-day -day life. But because once you're constantly remembering Baba, he's doing whatever you're doing, then you don't get fresh ones coming to you. And therefore, you gain in so many ways. You know, there, your sanskaric burdens is getting less and less, and you're getting so much joy out of doing something for somebody. And if you really don't want to do something, um, I think for myself, it's always better to say, no, really, I don't feel like doing this, rather than doing it resentfully and calling it service. But I'm doing it, yeah, because I'm doing it. I, I don't do that. I just say, no, not interested. Thank you very much. You know, Go find somebody else. Fred, you had a... My question was, uh, my comment was related to Jericho. Okay. Uh, well, ask. Well, I heard through Jeff McGuire, I wish Jeff was here to tell the story. When, uh, out of Erico's class in high school, uh, two or three big executives, one guy went to uh, be a CEO, I think, of General Electric, another guy a big shot in the TV industry. And in his yearbook, they said, Mm. They would be surprised to be president of the United States one day. That's how special they were. That's was. right. And then yeah. he went to India to live the very and serve. Yes. The, the fakiri, the life of a fakir. You know, I remember James Cox telling me, James Cox was, uh, Erica was James's Baba contact. He brought James Cox to Baba. And I think he was his junior in college. And he said before he met Heather and came to Baba, Erica was... And this, uh, these are James's words. He said he was a super stud. You know, girls would line up, and they knew that there was a girl waiting inside already. But he was so m magnetic, and he was so attractive that they were drawn to him. But then he met Heather, and all of that went out of the window. Yes. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't go into there. No. Yes. Watch on the Samadhi. <laughs> yes. Anybody. Anybody. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, Erico was so beloved. Talking about high school teachers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Erica, wherever you are, we love you. And you have been a part of our gathering today. Thank you. Jay Baba. I read God Speaks Cover to Cover because Baba said, do it once in your life. I. I read The Wayfarers because I loved that book. I thought it was such a fantastic book. And um, I read um, a lot of Infinite Intelligence while I was working with Merwan on the editing work. I never read the finished product. Um, How difficult was it to read How long? How oh, very difficult. Very, 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 very difficult. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And I did read the discourses, and I love the discourses because you can open the discourses 
to a page when you need an answer and usually I get my answer to whatever question I'm asking. It's like reading the Bhagavad Gita, you know, it has the answer to every question ever asked. You know what? I saw them dressed up, but I never was there when they were actually selecting it. But if it's anything like the process with which these people select the bed sheet for Baba's bed these days, I'm very glad I wasn't there. It's like, <laughs> it's a bed sheet or a sari for heaven's sake, you know, just get on and pull one out and put it on. This, this is, should we have this one? Should we have that one? No, you pick the last one, so I'm going to pick the next one. Please. They looked beautiful when they were all dressed up. But <laughs> I'm very glad I wasn't part of the process of them getting there. Yeah. Yes. Right, now we are very depleted. Um, on our side, there is only Falu, Merwan, and myself. We live on the men's side. And Michael McDonald, not McDonald, sorry, Michael Ramsden and Peter Weiner live in the staff quarters that are built to that side of the car park. Um, on the ladies' side, we have permanently staying there Devana, Casey, and Shelley. Shelley is the only one who is allowed to live in the main bungalow by the, you know, when the Mandli was setting out the Merazad charter, they decided that she was the only one who would stay there. Uh, the other two have a little cottage of their own where they stay and there is a guest room there for people who come to help out and have to stay for a period of time. Like now I'm here, Julie Morris from Australia is there looking after Merwan. She goes for morning walks and evening walks with him and sits with him in the evening while he has his milk and biscuits and what have you. Because you know, he's always lived with people and he finds it very difficult, though he would never admit it, he finds it really difficult to just be by himself in the evening especially. During the day, he's busy doing work around Merazad, but come evening, he wants somebody that he can talk to, somebody he can say good night to, and you know, and sh she does that. But she also does a lot of other things. She's uh, helping out in, with the cleaning of the main bungalow, and uh, she does work in the Merazad archive building. So she's very useful. And we now have inherited Shiana, Cloud Tree, who was with Bao, and who's now, a, she's a Merazad resident in the sense that she's mainly based there, but she lives in the staff quarters near the dispensary. She and Merdad, they're the two people who live over there. Where Mitra used to, Where Mitra used to live. Side, yeah. huh? Nobody else is on side. No, there's just Merdad and uh, Shiana. Yeah. That's yes. A good That's a very good staff yeah. uh, quarter because you can see Seclusion Hill as soon as you get up, it's out of your window, seclusion hill. Beautiful, beautiful place. Very beautiful. Merazad is a lovely place to live in. It's so peaceful, you know, and I'm getting to that stage now where I think, you know, I'm really looking forward to going back because <laughs> I, still have the, I still have 17 days, but Merazad has that pull, even though it's, it's hard work, you know. We used to have endless sort of headaches when I was cooking there. I cooked there for three or four years. And uh, at that time, Arnavas had orders from Baba about what she could eat and what she couldn't eat. Manu had orders from Baba about what she could eat and couldn't eat. Balnatu had doctor's orders about what he could eat and couldn't eat. Erich had doctor's orders about what he could eat and couldn't eat. You know, everybody was eating different food. And I was cooking all of this food, and there were times when nobody was pleased with me. It was like, what did you give us to eat today? So, but it was good fun. Aloba was so sweet. You know, he loved his food. He absolutely loved, and he especially loved non-vegetarian food. And whenever I would make little kebabs or cutlets or something and send them with the lunch, afternoon tea time, he would come to me. He would say, Today, I have asked Baba to bless you many, many times. What a meal! What a meal! He said, Kya khana banaya mera? Kya khana banaya? I said, I've asked Baba to bless you especially for cooking the meal. 
And he would sit outside, you know, on where Pendu's chair is on the veranda. And Manu would occasionally make spicy scrambled eggs or something special for Merwan and herself and me who were staying there. And he would sit and he would get the scent of it and he would shout from the window, Manubai, what are you cooking? And she would say, Aloba, shall I send some out for you? Yes, yes, send, send. <laughs> so then he would, you know, he would get his little plate of snacks. He was such a darling, absolute darling. And Balnatu had a white diet. He would only eat white food. Yeah. Rice and yogurt, rice and something else. It was all white. Except, except when we made um, khichri and uh, curry made from yogurt. Now, as a Brahmin, that was his staple food and he absolutely loved it. So when that was cooked, he would shower blessings. So I have been very blessed for my cooking, you know. Uh, it's good fun. Yeah. Padri? Yes, I do remember him very well. Yeah, we used to go in the old days when there was no MPC or anything. We would live in those little rooms, you know. And all of us would go, and uh, his um, maid servant, what was her name? Uh, Sidhu, Sidhubai's uh, wife, she would make us tea and chapatis in the morning, especially during Amartiti. And I still remember one time we were trying to knock off some of those bora berries from the tree by his clinic. And my sister was standing down below and gathering them up as I knocked them off. And I couldn't get to one, so I chucked the bamboo up, and it came, landed crash on her head. And she started bleeding and I was terrified. And Padri came running out because I started shouting and he said, what have you done? <laughs> I said, I'm, you know, I was trying to get the boras and uh, it fell on Dolly's head. Don't shout, he said. It's nothing serious. Always if somebody gets hurt on the scalp, it bleeds a lot. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so then he doused and he said, why didn't you call me? I'm so much taller than both of you. I could have knocked them down for you. Padri was, yeah, you know, but we used to watch him in action and he was so authoritative and he was so uh, respected, the whole village respected him. It, as long as Padri was alive, Merabad had no problems because he used to keep everybody, including the village Gram Panchayat and everybody else un, in control. He was very good at that. Yeah? Yeah. How, um, how did, what were the ways that you brought Baba into helping them? I mean, also we're talking about the people with different uh, spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs, different cultures. And how did it come through to you or for you to bring Baba to them that, you know, to help them in their treatment? Well, if they asked me specifically about what my belief system was, I always tell them. But, um, you know, I. I don't like working with people who don't work hard for themselves. So if I take on a client, we have an agreement. And the agreement is that I will sign them up for eight sessions at a time. Yes. And if at the end of the eight sessions, I feel that they're not doing enough work to help themselves, um, I stop working with them. I tell them they need to find another therapist. But one of the things that I realized from working with a lot of people, including couples, is that it is very difficult for somebody to focus on what's going on within themselves if they are in a relationship and uh, actually in a physical relationship. So for the first eight sessions, they have to commit to being celibate for two months. Yeah. And almost everybody, except one person who said, I can't hack that, um, everybody else says, I feel so liberated by these two months of abstinence because there is nobody else's energy interfering with what I'm doing, you know. So for them, it's, it's like taking a break from their problems and just focusing on me and how to work. And I tell them, I say, I, this, this part of your therapy is a direct gift from Mayor Baba because that's something that I got out of Baba's teachings is that you cannot focus on too many things. You know, he said, I'm a jealous lover, so you focus on him. And nobody else so far has complained except that one guy who said, no, 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 I can't. <laughs> in fact, one, one of my uh, online clients, he's in Brazil. He's a photographer and an artist. And 
his whole problem was with his own personal self-image. He's a gorgeous looking guy. He really is very handsome. But he always thought he was not handsome enough. And he had a very strong narcissistic streak that led him to have relationship after relationship. He was, he is gay. And he, you know, he was always looking out for the next man in his life. And when I said to him, you have, you have to stop for two months, no more looking, no more going online, trolling the internet dating sites for a new conquest. I said, you have to break that for two months. Can you do it? And he said, I'll do my very best. And then, in fact, if ever he thought he was slipping, he would leave me a message on Skype saying, can we have an extra session so that I can talk about it? He finished his eight sessions very quickly because he was always having extra <laughs> sessions. <laughs> But at the end of it all, he said, I have learned that I can do without somebody always telling me how wonderful I am. Because coming with that how wonderful I am is the flip side where when I do something that they don't like, I become like, you know, I become criticized. I'm not good enough. He said, I get no more mixed messages. So he, he has committed for himself to being really selective with whom he's going to share his body next. That's what he told me. He wrote and said to me, Mera, I am committed to being very selective with whom I share myself next. So he obviously benefited from it. And I find that very helpful for people to stop. You know, a lot of the time, if you stop and you change the way you behave, it's very helpful to you yourself. It gives you breathing space. And that's definitely direct Baba. Silence is also good. You know, asking people to keep silent for periods of time. A day. Take a day out and be silent. Okay. Thursday we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> and you don't even need to have any problems to do that. You just do it. But for people who've never kept silent, that's, that's a big challenge. When I was little and we had silence day, I used to write letters to Baba and they were the most eloquent letters I've ever written to him. And he would send a note back saying, I really enjoyed your letter. Yeah. So you were quite yes. But, you know, I was told by Baba, write as often as you can. So we would write to him about school and about what was happening. You know, so and so said such and such. Yeah. So what would you tell Baba lovers who don't think it's important? It's that, that is their problem. We don't have to worry about telling them anything. They don't want to keep silence. They don't keep silence. So you don't say anything like this is what Baba said? No, no. You know, it's, it's well documented that Baba wanted people to keep silence on the 10th of July, from midnight of the 9th to midnight of the 10th. And if you feel that that's not important in your relationship with Baba, of course, that's your choice. I never try and convince anybody otherwise. You know, you follow Baba your own way. Yeah, <laughs> and we ate a lot of food. I think that'll be such a freeing experience because Baba didn't come to establish a religion. He came to bring all religions together like beads on a string. And I think that if you were a Christian and you really were attached to your Christian rituals and rites and everything, you could continue doing that and still be a Baba lover. And you would, you would feel happy doing that because there are, n there are no other rituals. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. As time goes by, rituals and practices and everything will creep in and uh, people will be made to feel guilty for not being there at morning RT and evening RT. You know, it's already happening. You were there all these weeks and you came to morning RT only twice, you know, 
It's already happening. Yeah. No, the, the girls sit over there, Shelley and Casey and Devana, they sit over there. Somebody, somebody will always sit over there because for people going into the house to look at Mera's room and uh, the dining room and everything, they need somebody there to direct. And as time goes by, you know, they sit and they talk to each other. Somebody can sit in and become a part of that conversation or not. But the, the way the, the ladies used to be telling their stories, and that's not going to come back. That's not going to come back. I can. I just choose not to. I don't. I, I mean, I don't enjoy it. I sit in the Mandli Hall with Merwan. Yeah, when Devana lets me. <laughs> I don't. I let her sit there. You want to sit there? Sit there. It's okay. You know, he's. My relationship with Merwan is not defined by my sitting next to him, but if she feels happy doing it, okay, by all means. I used to be jealous about that other Merwan, not this one. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Karen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I can assume that Baba would come to the house at all hours. All hours. And whatever time he came, and, and everybody was up. And yeah, did. yeah. And also, when he came, when we first came, Baba was up. No, two weeks? Two weeks. Yeah. So they, when did they finally unlock the stone? After three years. Oh. Because Papa went and said to Baba, he said, Baba, tell them at least to unpack my clothes. If they don't want to unpack theirs, they can not unpack this. But they were sleeping on the trunks. You know, they would put a mattress on the trunk and sleep on it. They were ready to move at a moment's notice. So, but uh, Papa was very, um, he liked to mix with the Zoroastrian community. So he would, he would want his dagla and his topi and everything. And that was packed away in the trunk. So he, would, he went to Baba and he complained. He said, these people are not unpacking my things. If they don't want to unpack, I don't care. But I want my things unpacked. You order them to unpack. So he did actually order them to unpack at that point in time. Yeah. Do you have it? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Mad Dogs and Englishmen. <laughs> Money loved this song. Money absolutely loved, loved, loved this song. Bhauji also loved this song, yes. Do you want my mic? You no, can no, no, please, please. Uh, I'll be up here. Okay. In the tropical climes, there are certain times of day when the citizens retire to take their clothes off and perspire. If one of those rules that the greatest fools obey, because the sun is far too sultry and must avoid its ultraviolet ray, the natives grieve when the white men leave their huts because they're obviously definitely nuts. Bad dogs and Englishmen go out in the day sun. The Japanese don't care. The Chinese don't dare to. Hindus and the Indians sleep firmly from 12 to 1. But, but Englishmen detest a siesta. In the Philippines, they have <laughs> lovely screens to protect, protect you from the glare. In the Maytay states, there are hats like plates, while the British, well, see, don't wear. At 12 noon, the natives swoon, and no further work is done. But mad, mad dogs, dogs and Englishmen go, go out to the midday sun. Such a surprise for the Eastern eyes that though the English defeat, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee because the simple creatures hope he will inflate his solar topi on a tree. It seems such a shame when the English claim the earth and they give rise to such hilarity and mirthy. <laughs> 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 in a jungle town, when the sun beats down to the 
rage of man and beast. The English garb is the English sahib, meaning gets a bit more cre uh, creased. In, the, the, in Bangkok, at 12 o'clock, they, they foam at the mouth and run, but mad dogs and Englishmen, Englishmen go, go out, out in the midday sun. sun. They go out in the midday sun. <laughs> the, smallest, <laughs> the smallest rabbit deplores this English habit. And the notes keep coming as I write and see off the internet. Please. <laughs> 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 mad dogs and Englishmen and go out in the midday sun. sun. The roughest Burmese man can never have a it. In Rangoon, the heat of noon is just what the natives shun. They put down their scotch and rye and lie down. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. In Bengal, they move, uh, they very seldom move, if ever. But mad dogs and Englishmen, they go out in the midday sun, go out in the midday sun, go out in the, in the midday, midday sun, sun, go out in the midday sun, sun, go out in the midday sun. Oh. Thank you, <laughs> Baba. Yes. They did. Yeah, we did too. Because we went to a convent school. We grew up with a lot of songs. You know, we, we, we learned how to sing The Happy Wanderer and things like that. And Mad Dogs and Englishmen. I, well, when we go up, yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely love it. Does anybody else have questions? Oh, Baba, oh, Baba, oh, 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 Baba, oh, Baba, Yes, I'd just like to say one more thing before you do that. Okay. Yeah, okay, you know, if you have any questions that you haven't asked by now, you can always find me wherever I am. And I will leave my email with uh, Mahu and people here. If you want to email me, you can feel free to email me a question whenever you like. You're welcome. Say bye-bye.